more speaker <coughs> um, at this session. Uh, Dr. Olewski is, is our medical oncologist who is in the back. <laughs> um, Dr. Olewski is, has uh, been very um, key in our, in our group in mesothelioma because obviously uh, medical therapy or, or drug therapy of some type, either targeted or, chemo or cytotoxic chemotherapy is, is key in, in maintaining what we can accomplish with surgery. So uh, over many years of uh, looking for people who are actually interested in, in looking at this, uh, it's been very difficult to find people that in medical oncology who are interested in making this their area of, of uh, interest. Uh, and so Dr. Olewski is, is uh, I mean, we're working with her for a number of years, five, six, seven years now, but uh, more recently she's been really taking the ball and, and being uh, the person that we go to for, for input from, from uh, for chemotherapy and targeted therapies and doing drug trials, uh, like was mentioned. And she's going to give us a, a summary talk about uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy in mesothelioma and the issue of timing. So, Dr. Levsky. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me here. Um, as always, when there is a mixed audience and there are both physicians and non-physicians in the audience, I ask the non-physicians not to focus on the statistics so much uh, because those can be difficult and there are many, many outliers and people that are here in the room are likely to be outliers and not to fall in the middle of the bell curve. So um, what I will discuss today is chemotherapy and some of it I have um, tough speakers to follow, some of it is gonna be repetitive, uh, but um, nevertheless, um, uh, we'll proceed. I have no disclosures. Um, there is, uh, up until 2003, every single drug on earth has been tried for mesothelioma and no standardized chemotherapy for mesothelioma was um, identified. A meta-analysis of 119 trials demonstrated that a combination chemotherapy, especially cisplatin-based regimen, provided better response than single agent therapy alone. And finally, in 2003, uh, we had two international trials that demonstrated that combination therapy with either pemetrexid or raltitrexid increases survival compared to single agent uh, cisplatin. Uh, both trials showed a significant increase in response rate and no deleterious impact in quality of life. So um, this is a brief uh, description uh, of the trial that was done in 2003. This is pemetrexid and cisplatin versus cisplatin alone. Um, and again, uh, these were unresectable uh, mesothelioma patients. This was a large trial for 156 patients. They were randomized. One group received cisplatin and pemetrexid given every three weeks. The other group received cisplatinum alone. And what we were able to see is that there was a longer overall survival and time to progression in patients that were given pemetrexid and cisplatin. Overall survival was 12.1 months in the pemetrexid and cisplatin group and 9.3 months in the cisplatin group alone. So this study established that the combination of cisplatin and pemetrexid uh, given an every three weeks uh, basis uh, is the standard of care for unresectable patients with mesothelioma. Again, similar results were achieved in the ERTC trial in Europe uh, with the relative Traxit. So the current recommendation is to administer at least four courses of uh, cisplatinum and pemetrexid therapy. Uh, an issue that comes up is whether carboplatin can be substituted for cisplatinum. This issue was evaluated in the International Extended Access Program trial. Uh, this was multicenter but non-randomized open-label trial 
where um, patients were enrolled and received pemetrexid plus cisplatin versus pemetrexid, pemetrexid plus carboplatin was a large trial. And what we were able to see that the overall response rates were quite similar. 26.3% uh, was cisplatin and 27.1% with carboplatin. The one-year survival were also similar. So cisplatin and pemetrexid is considered to be the regimen of choice, but if need be, uh, carboplatin could, could be substituted for cisplatin. So uh, what we will get to today and what we will discuss today is the timing of the chemotherapy. What is the best time to deliver chemotherapy? Uh, chemotherapy can be given as an induction or neoadjuvant, meaning given preoperatively. It, be, it can be given perioperatively, intravenously. And be, it can be given intrapleural, which is uh, similar to perioperative approach. And it can be given postoperatively or in an adjuvant way. And adjuvant comes from a Latin word, adju, which means to help. So adjuvant is a helper to the surgeon uh, to make the disease better. Uh, there are several ways of delivering adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, it can be delivered immediately postoperatively uh, following uh, the radiation therapy or before the radiation therapy, or um, it can be delivered, uh, it can be delayed and delivered at the time of recurrence. So clinical consideration that we have uh, when we think about chemotherapy is that response rates to the best chemotherapy that we have, as I just showed you, are not optimal. Uh, they are 26 to 40 percent. Uh, monitoring uh, is quite difficult uh, since uh, in mesothelioma, as you have seen in the previous videos and slides, uh, the disease is rather diffuse and it's very difficult to measure separate nodules and resist criteria do not usually apply. Uh, planned multimodality therapy becomes quite difficult uh, when extensive surgery is followed by immediate administration of rather toxic chemotherapy uh, followed by uh, radiation. Uh, despite the state of the art radiation, uh, radiation is not always easy for patients to tolerate. And uh, usually the toxicities of combined modalities are usually rather significant. Uh, we also have to keep in mind uh, that these are not uh, young patients. Uh, the patients are usually the average age is around 70, and some of the patients can be rather frail. So first, uh, we will focus on the neoadjuvant approach and on the induction therapy. Um, multiple trials have been done, and most of the patients that were screened were eligible for the trials. And in fact, 90% of the patients that were screened were able to enter the trials. However, even in those controlled trials, not many patients actually, actually were able to make it to surgery or complete a full course of chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, overall survival in the neoadjuvant trials was 16 to 25 months. So this is uh, a list of neoadjuvant chemotherapy trials. Uh, Dr. Percy Lee showed some of these before. I'm going to focus on the uh, first trial and the Krug trial, uh, which was the largest one. Uh, the number of patients entering the trial were 75. Uh, they were given uh, a neoadjuvant uh, drug uh, regimen, cisplatinum and pemetrexid. Uh, when you look at, the, um, at the, um, this column, EPP, these patients have undergone extrapleural pneumonectomy. So from 75, the number went down to 50, and then the patients that were able to make it to radiation, the number was only 42. And again, the median overall survival, unfortunately, was only 16 months. 
Uh, this is a complete uh, list of the prospective trials. Uh, we're not mentioning the retrospective trial. And the important trial that I would like to focus on and uh, is the largest trial that you can see here. And this is the MARS trial, which involved 301 patients. In summary, and uh, considering the academic institutions, approximately 47 to 70 Eight percent of the patients do make it to surgery. However, uh, most patients progressed after the surgery or had unacceptable toxicity that precluded them uh, from receiving um, further treatment. Uh, only total of 46 to 60 patients completed all therapy. Uh, and what was unique and interesting about the MARS trial, first of all, it was very large. It was conducted throughout Europe, and it was not conducted. It was a cooperative group trial. It was not conducted in a single institution. It, co it uh, collected more of the community patients. So it was much less uh, selected patient population and probably more typical patient population. And in this trial, um, only 37% um, of the patients were able to complete the chemo, 16% of the patients went to surgery, and only 9% of the patients were able to complete the treatment. Uh, so the results uh, of this trial uh, were somewhat controversial uh, because there were um, controversy about uh, the quality control um, who was doing the surgery, uh, whether the therapies were controlled, but nevertheless, uh, this is the largest trial that we have to date. Uh, the, um, most of the time, uh, the surgery can be done with acceptable mortality, and we'll show you later our mortality here at UCLA, but in the MARS trial, the mortality from the surgery was rather high, it was 12.5%. So the reason, again, uh, neoadjuvant or the help on therapy is given, the goal of giving the chemotherapy is to control the gross diseases to shrink it, but most importantly, the goal of chemotherapy is to prevent uh, micrometastatic disease or prevent metastases. And here we have the recurrence rates uh, in eight non-randomized trial. Uh, and you can see that uh, the local recurrence rate is around 40%. The distant recurrence rate, which again, that was the purpose of giving chemotherapy, is to prevent the spread of the disease, was rather spread out. And the overall recurrence, um, as you can see, unfortunately, was very high. Uh, so the next... Um, way of delivering chemotherapy. Uh, we can deliver chemotherapy either intraoperatively or perioperatively. Um, this is quite interesting for us oncologists because here the dose of chemotherapy is given by the surgeons and is given in the recovery room via chest tube. Um, what uh, this makes sense that the higher dose of chemotherapy would be delivered to the pleura, would be delivered to the tumor, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the levels um, of the drug when measured in the blood were really no different uh, than when chemotherapy was given systemically. And again, overall survival in these particular trials was really not different, and it was ranging from 11 to 18 months. Uh, this is a summary of the intraoperative chemotherapy trials. Uh, again, a dose of chemotherapy was given in the recovery room. However, in uh, most of these trials, the patient also received adjuvant systemic therapy, uh, even though um, those are the drugs that we no longer, we no longer use mitomycin or epirubicin. Uh, however, uh, the medial and overall survival uh, was not significantly different uh, than the survival that we have seen with uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, problems uh, with delivering intrapleural chemotherapy. Uh, again, the response rate is low. Uh, a single dose is given intraoperatively. Uh, there is a significant absorption and a lot more toxicity than we would anticipate. 
uh, multiple drugs may be necessary afterwards, and no randomized controlled trials are available. So now uh, we get to the most common way uh, of giving uh, chemotherapy. Uh, we give it adjuvantly or postoperatively. And uh, here's the, um, a list uh, of trials uh, that was compiled uh, where uh, adjuvant therapy was given uh, after extrapleural pneumonectomy. Uh, most of these trials were followed by uh, radiation, but not all of them. Overall survival in these trials was again between nine and 22 months. Uh, as you can see with the red arrow, there was one outlier uh, where survival uh, was 35 months. Uh, uh, this is uh, a, a pleurectomy and decortication uh, with adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation therapy uh, that is showing results that are quite similar uh, with overall survival numbers uh, that are similar to much more extensive extrapleural pneumonectomy. And again, the survival ranges anywhere between nine and 22 months. Uh, this is the adjuvant uh, therapy chart. Again, it's uh, not very different from the neoadjuvant uh, therapy chart. Uh, the recurrence rate, uh, uh, the distant, the local, and the overall are rather high. And again, the whole goal of chemotherapy is to prevent distant micrometastatic recurrence. So um, in terms of uh, adjuvant chemotherapy uh, for methotheliooma, uh, whether it's given after extrapleural pneumonectomy or after pleurectomy and decortication, was really no different in terms of survival uh, from neoadjuvant or intraoperative chemotherapy. So um, uh, we have to give credit to Dr. Cameron, who uh, really introduced the concept of delayed chemotherapy uh, many years ago, and we have been developing and following this model here at UCLA. So delayed chemotherapy means is that uh, the chemotherapy is given at the time of recurrence. It uh, may give patients a chance to recover and have a better quality of life in between, and what uh, we found was quite important is that we can see indicator lesions uh, that we could use to monitor the response. Uh, so advantages is that uh, it may allow for more aggressive initial surgery and or radiation approaches. Uh, Chemotherapy can be administered uh, not to everybody, but in a selected group of patients, uh, especially with epithelioid um, mesothelioma. There are a lot of patients that have localized disease to the chest that don't need systemic chemotherapy, and this disease can be approached with cryoablation or radiation. And it certainly um, allows uh, for better doses and a better patient tolerance if chemotherapy of knee is needed. And we can monitor the indicator lesions that we can see on the scans. Uh, there are also disadvantages, as with everything. Uh, this can allow for more progression of micrometastatic disease before treatment. Uh, people, uh, patients can develop more advanced disease and present with poor performance status and subsequently not be able to tolerate chemotherapy or simply be too sick. And therefore, there is a very narrow window for optimal timing of chemotherapy if it's needed, and patients have to be monitored very closely so they don't progress to the point where we lose the opportunity to really treat them. Uh, so this is the model uh, that uh, we have been using for chemotherapy timing. Uh, we're going to mostly focus on the epithelial, predominantly epithelioid uh, mesothelioma. Uh, if uh, we have bilateral disease, if uh, nodes are grossly involved, if there is distance disease, uh, we do administer neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And uh, mostly, I have been administering that, and we watch for the objective response. 
uh, if we see uh, a response uh, and a significant response from the chemo, uh, patients do go to pleurectomy and decortication, uh, but to be perfectly frank, uh, there have been not a lot of patients that we have been able to send to surgery uh, with epithelioid um, histologies. If the patients do not have an objective response, not even stable disease, uh, they do go to second line chemotherapy or they go to phase one and two study. And in fact, uh, we do have the trimalumumab study here, um, which we have been actually quite excited about and we have sent quite a few patients uh, to that study. Uh, so if um, in, um, if we do see patients in clinic for the first time, they have epithelioid predominant mesothelioma, uh, they don't have bilateral disease, uh, they do go straight to surgery um, and have pleurectomy and decortication. Uh, and then they go to Dr. Percy Lee to get the adjuvant radiation chemotherapy. And uh, usually uh, they get some sort of maintenance chemotherapy and it has been infant interferon alpha. Uh, if they have recurrent disease, uh, this is when we introduce uh, the chemotherapy. If they fail the first-line chemotherapy, they go to second-line chemotherapy. However, there are situations when uh, they do go to uh, chemotherapy earlier. If uh, they have positive margins, if they have positive nodes, uh, if they have the R2 uh, resection where gross disease is left behind, uh, they usually uh, do go to chemotherapy uh, first. So uh, let me tell you about our UCLA experience, which um, Dr. Cameron started in 1997. Um, I can't take credit for that. I wasn't here. Uh, I was, I don't know, in residency, I think, at that time. But uh, the patients, there were 120, 121 patients. They have been followed up until 2011. Uh, this was single institution, UC, uh, UCLA, and single surgeon that is sitting right here. Um, they have, all the patients have had all uh, lung sparing uh, pleurectomy and decortication uh, with uniform approach. Although with time, the extent of visceral pleurectomy changed over time uh, with more disease taken out at the time of surgery, and I will show you why that was done. Um, the patient characteristics were rather typical, 77% uh, male, 22% female, 80% um, right lung, 41% um, left lung. Uh, mean age of the patient was uh, 64.9 or 65. However, there were patients that were over 70. In fact, 30, a third of the patients were over 70, uh, with 40% of them being men and 11% being women. And uh, about 86% of the patients, or most of them, had asbestos exposure. Um, they were, most of them were smokers, 54% of the patients. Uh, they were fairly uh, healthy. They had uh, only 12% of them had more than 10% body loss. Uh, they had the typical uh, comorbidities that we see in patients of that age, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, and peripheral vascular disease. Um, 3% of the patients had strokes. And uh, in fact, uh, some of them had other neoplasms. And one of the patients uh, actually died of prostate cancer and was uh, free of mesothelioma uh, at the time of death. Uh, this is what we usually uh, see uh, in clinic. And this is our initial clinical staging. So uh, from uh, the scanning and physical examination and biopsies, uh, we do see that the patients mostly appear to have stage one disease and only pleural involvement. So 90% of the patients clinically are staged as uh, stage one. Uh, so here are the surgery details. 
uh, mean anesthesia time is nine hours and 18 minutes, uh, mean surgical time is seven hours and 57 minutes, uh, but the surgeries can last quite a bit longer, uh, up to 14 hours. Um, there are usually no central venous catheters. Uh, uh, what was impressive to me is that most of the patients were extubated in the operating room. Um, there were approximately 1.9 uh, units of blood that were transfused. And uh, after these complicated surgeries, uh, there was no ICU care in 80% of these patients. Um, Perioperative mortality uh, is 2.5%, uh, which is quite a bit less uh, than uh, median uh, that we saw. Uh, the kinds of perioperative morbidity that we see in clinic is that there is a prolonged air leak, uh, that the lung just doesn't seal. 70% uh, of the patients have air leak for five days. Uh, about 30% have um, air leak for 10 days, and some of them are discharged with little chest tubes, which they don't like, with Heimlich valves, but usually those are taken out on their post-operative visits. Um, as is in any cardiac or thoracic surgery, atrial arrhythmias are common, and all other complications were less than 4%. Uh, the median length of stay in the hospital uh, was 10 days. Um, so what uh, we were able to see in pathology is that um, residual uh, localized visible tumor was only left in 4% uh, of the patients, uh, meaning that uh, most of them had the R1 resection and most of the visible disease uh, was um, uh, removed. Uh, so again, the complete resection of all visible tumor was done in 95% of the uh, patient. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the surgeries became uh, more extensive uh, because uh, microscopic margins uh, were evaluated. So random biopsies were performed in 63 patients. So what that means is that uh, even though there was no gross disease visible to the surgeon eye, uh, the biopsy was performed, and the biopsies were negative in 63% of the patients. However, uh, the biopsies that looked negative to the eye were positive in 36% of the patient, and uh, that was positive on microscopy. So the resections became more extensive trying to take out that microscopic disease. So the mean tumor weight that was excised uh, was uh, 700 grams, which is a lot. Um, what we have found uh, after the surgery is that the pathologic staging was significantly more advanced uh, than clinical staging was Im would imply, and that most of the patients, in fact, were not stage one, uh, but were stage three, uh, where mediastinal nodes were involved and chest wall structures were involved. Um, uh, some of the patients uh, were stage four with T4 disease. So if we look uh, at overall survival um, of all comers, 121 patients, the overall survival was 13 months. If we break it down by sex, we know that women do better. So the survival was 20 uh, months in women, which was statistically significant. Uh, what was also uh, known and significant is that uh, with asbestos exposure, uh, the survival is significantly less. Uh, we did not address other histologies in this presentation, uh, but uh, people that deal with dis this disease know that biphasic uh, mesothelioma patients do worse and sarcomatoid mesotheliomas uh, act uh, more like sarcomas. Uh, than mesotheliomas and have uh, significantly worse prognosis. So uh, let's look at the data for the delayed uh, chemotherapy cohort. So these are the patients that have undergone pleurectomy and decortication. 
Uh, they have routinely uh, have gone to post-operative adjuvant radiation uh, with uh, delayed post-operative chemotherapy, meaning that they got chemotherapy at the time of their recurrence. Uh, patients were excluded, uh, excluded patients were the ones that received neoadjuvant chemotherapy that uh, did not receive postoperative radiation, uh, that received some sort of unspecified therapies, or that were lost to follow up. Uh, the patients, we included the patients that were receiving any chemotherapy uh, at the time of recurrence. So if we look at the patients that uh, received pleurectomy and decortication, uh, followed by immediate radiation therapy, and followed by delayed chemotherapy, uh, the survival of these patients was 19.7 months. And of course, um, we are not allowed to do cross-study comparisons, but we do it all the time anyway. So um, I will show you the data uh, that again was shown to you before. Uh, this is the trimodality therapy with EPP is the original um, Dana-Farber uh, data presented by Dr. Sugarbaker. The survival was 19 months. And then there were several trials. There were two trials of neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, followed by EPP and followed by hemothoracic radiation. Uh, the survival was 16.8 months in one study and 14.4 months in another study. So the conclusions uh, that we have is that uh, mesothelioma has uh, clearly no best therapy, uh, that pleurectomy and decortication can remove all gross disease uh, in the right hands in more than 90% uh, of the time and um, this is equivalent to complete response to chemotherapy. So if we can only have 40% of response with chemotherapy and have 90% of the disease removed in surgery, we do prefer to go to surgery first if possible. Uh, we see that delaying postoperatively chemotherapy until disease recurrence uh, does not appear to uh, affect the patients adversely and uh, provides roughly equivalent survival to more radical uh, treatment options. And of course, as we just heard at the previous talk, uh, novel adjuvant therapies and randomized trials are uh, desperately needed, and it seems uh, that there are some uh, targets uh, that are on the way and to be explored. Uh, these are our collaborators, and this is our group, and thank you very much.